Thank you for bearing with us, everybody. Um, we're hopefully gonna have a good event from now. But yes, um, I wanted to firstly thank, well, all of you for make, taking the time to come, for this, come to this event. It's very important to us. Um, and it is the end of your final event for actually all three clubs. So this is a big deal for us and thank you so much for coming in. And of course, I want to take the time to thank Dr. Fellows and Micah for coming here, ta for taking time out of their busy schedules. Uh, just for this event. Thank you so much for coming here. It is a pleasure to have you. It is an honor to have you. Um, but yes, just so everybody knows again, um, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, just in case you just entered and didn't hear that before, just letting you know so you can turn your cameras off, just whatever you're most comfortable with. So just to get started, abortion is a massive issue that has found its way far into contemporary debate and due to the importance of this issue. There is a resultant massive split between the sides that exist in regards to this issue. And each side, as a result, often finds itself either misrepresented or silenced. So this is why we found it so important to have a, a debate as open as possible on a platform that allows for every side to be heard without any judgment and without any silencing. So thank you for coming here. Um, uh, I'll just go over the structure of the debate so that everybody understands how this is going to go out. Um, firstly, Dr. Fellows will be representing the pro-choice side and Micah will be representing the pro-life side. Um, so the structure of the debate is as follows. First, there will be an opening statement for both speakers to introduce their stances, give an introduction on what they think on the issue. And this will then be followed by a series of questions. So to each question, the speakers will be given seven to 10 minutes to answer on the first round. Then there'll be a round for rebuttaling where each speaker can raise points or counterpoints and arguments or questions to the other speaker after their speech. And then there'll be a short answering round, which will be five minutes, which we may extend to seven minutes if need be. Um, finally, um, there, after the series of questions, we will basically be done with the main structure of the event, but it'll then be followed by a Q&A session where the audience members can ask questions. Uh, so in case there were questions that any one of you had in your mind, which you felt weren't, uh, weren't talked about at all, uh, there'll actually be, uh, and I think Nina should be putting it up now, uh, there'll be a link uh, that you'll see in the chat. Um, so this link will lead you to a polling system. So you can type in any questions that you feel weren't answered, and then all of you can vote on those questions. And the most voted questions will be the ones that we'll then ask during the Q&A session. And that'll be a very free-flowing free discussion with no essential structure so that it's just positive discourse with everyone uh, engaging in it. Um, also, Nina, did you uh, want to tell everybody about uh, the other club and their invitation to the discussion? So I just wanted to thank everyone for coming. Um, there's three clubs that are collaborating here. And um, so in terms of the debate, in terms of the speakers, that's who I'm going to really focus on. We have Michael Rosendahl. She is a seasoned pro-life speaker who began to make a difference for preborn children. She was involved in bringing the debate to campus on many occasions through this. And through this, she came into contact with the Canadian Center for Bioethical Reform. Micah became convicted of the crucial role that abortion victim photography must play in changing our culture. After obtaining a Bachelor of Social Work from the University of Calgary in 2009, Michael worked as a community liaison for the Lethbridge and District Pro-Life Association, for which she provided counseling and educational outreach for Southern, in Southern Alberta. Michael then joined the pro-life delegation to the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women in 2011. And Dr. Fellows, here's a little bit about him. So Dr. Fe Fellows is an emeritus professor in the Faculty of Medicine Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Western University. The scope of his employment encompasses clinical OBGYN, educating students and postgraduate trainees, administration and research. The primary focus of his practice includes general and high risk obstetrics and the provision of abortion services 
including director of the Pregnancy Options Program until his retirement two years ago. Currently, he teaches medical students and opinions in medical legal matters. Dr. Fellows' de dedication to the provision of abortion services began around the time of Roe v. Wade and was primarily endorsed by his professional experience witnessing maternal morbidity, mortality when the choice was denied to women, provincially, nationally, and internationally. Thank you so much for that introduction. I uh, just wanted to say a little bit about our clubs too. Um, so Students for Free Speech uh, is a club where we, we essentially try to provide a platform as best as we can to any and all voices. And it was basically formed when we saw a lot of voices being silenced, a lot of just people and their ideas being silenced, which is so wrong to the fundamental ideal of free speech to us. So that's what our club is based on, which is why we're having this event as well, which is based on exactly that same philosophy. Um, Nina, would you like to introduce uh, your club, followed by Josephine? The club that I'm the president of is Youth Protecting Youth. We are the pro-life club on York University campus. Our main goal is to advocate for life and educate those on York University campus about what goes on, with regards to abortion, and we are doing our part to defend life on campus. I'm the president of the Health and Medical Law Society. So given that we're very interested in exploring the intersection between health and law, abortion is obviously a very interesting and contentious issue for us that we would love to get um, your opinion on and get the discussion going there. So uh, my club has basically, it's a pretty new club. It's been here for two years. So thank you for SFS and YPY for letting us collaborate on this event with us. And thank you all again for coming. Awesome, thank you so much guys. Um, well, all right then. Uh, so for this debate, Nina and I are going to be the main moderators. Um, we try to keep it interesting. Um, so Nina and I are both on different sides on this debate, uh, but we felt that it would be interesting if both of us ask questions to the speakers that represent the opposite side to what we stand for. So for instance, I am personally pro-choice, but I would love to ask Micah questions and understand as best as I can her side. And yeah, Nina, would you like to say anything? Myself? Um, well, considering I'm the president of the Pro-Life Club, I am very much pro-life. And so I'm very interested in asking Dr. Fellow's questions for this debate. All right, and I guess we can start then. First, we'll have opening statements. Uh, Micah, you can go first, followed by Dr. Fellows. So thank you so much. Um, I'm very grateful to the different campus clubs that have collaborated to make this event possible. I'm grateful to Dr. Fellows for being willing to debate once again. And to everyone who has joined us to watch, I'm seeing 227 participants here on Zoom. Um, and I know that various people from around the world are actually watching this debate as well. So that's fantastic. Now, when I immigrated to Canada in 2004, I had a tutor by the name of Cynthia, who um, taught me, who improved, helped me to improve my English so that I could pass a test to enter university, so I could be an international student. And there were two things that she did that she taught me that are still beneficial to me today. The first thing she did is she required me to write an essay every single day for four months straight. The second thing she did was uh, she taught me to examine the words that I came across that were foreign to me or phrases that were foreign to me. And she taught me to ask questions like, what is it? What does it make you think of? What is the root of the word? Well, tonight we've come together online to examine abortion and to look at different sides of the abortion debate. But automatically my mind goes to those questions that Cynthia taught me. What is it? Before I can take or defend a perspective, I need to know what it is. And so for most people watching, that will be an easy question. Most of you will say, okay, well, obviously we know the answer to that. But as part of my work for the Canadian Center for Bioethical Reform, I have stood on Canadian streets and asked people the question, what do you think about abortion? And there has been a fair number of people, perhaps they're immigrants like I once was, or um, perhaps the, the topic is just not familiar to them, who have said, abortion? What's that? 
Well, many of you might answer that question by saying, easy, it's the termination of a pregnancy. So let's break that down. Terminating is ending. And a pregnancy is the state in which a woman gestates her offspring in her uterus or her womb. So yes, abortion ends a pregnancy, but how is that accomplished? Well, the Canadian Institute for Health Information or the CIHI reports that approximately 60% of abortions in Canada take place up until 12 weeks of pregnancy. Of course, a medical abortion or abortion pill is available at that time, but most frequently actually a surgical abortion procedure is used, which is either a vacuum aspiration abortion or a, a DNC, a curatage abortion. So after a woman's cervix is anesthetized and her cervix is dilated through the use of metal rods or laminaria, a suction catheter is inserted into her room through her vagina. And when the suction machine is turned on, a force, um, a, a, a suction about 10 to 20 times more powerful than your household vacuum will shred the body of a tiny preborn child and also suction out the amniotic fluid for the placenta and the placenta. Sometimes this is followed up by the use of a curette, which scrapes out any remaining body parts and the placenta to prevent infection. Now, lest you think that I exaggerate when I say body parts, I have been able to obtain medical models of embryos and fetuses during pregnancy. So um, these you can find at your midwife's office or at your OBGYN, or if you were to go to the Ontario, um, the Science Museum, you can see an entire uh, display on them there. So this is a medical model of a 12 week, um, uh, of a child at 12 weeks of pregnancy. So a DNC could be used for this child as well. Now, later on in pregnancy, obviously different techniques have to be used when a, when a suction uh, abortion no longer will do the job, but the method in every case is the same. By ending the life of the embryo or fetus, the woman is no longer pregnant. What else do we know? Well, the CIHI, which I just mentioned, has as its most recent statistic that in, um, that in 2018, 85,195 abortions took place in Canada. But it notes that these numbers are incomplete because there are no reporting requirements for abortion clinics. And uh, especially in the province of Quebec, we don't have reliable numbers. So this at best is an estimate. When I called the abortion clinics in Toronto, I was told by various staff members that the requests for abortions are on the rise since COVID-19. So likely the number of abortions that take place in Canada is far greater than the number the CIHI can give us. But at the very least, we know that 233 abortions take place every day in Canada alone. Considering then how common abortion is in our country, I think it is safe to say that all of us have been affected by abortion in some way. Whether some of you have had an abortion yourself or helped someone get an abortion, perhaps it was your partner, but just the very fact that there are 233 every day, considering that there are two parents necessary to create offspring, that affects a lot of people and again, their families and their friends. And so I want to acknowledge that this topic can be an emotional one and a personal one. In doing this work for over 10 years now, countless women have confided in me about the challenging, heartbreaking, or outright unjust circumstances of their pregnancy. And I have gained an understanding of how and why women choose abortion. So regardless of where we stand on this issue, whether pro-life or pro-choice, anti-abortion or pro-abortion, I think we can all agree that many of those circumstances are difficult. And I think that we can all agree that we want less, not more suffering. Now the question of course, is what that means concerning abortion. I hope we can also agree in having this debate 
that we should follow the facts where they lead us, even if that leads to a difficult or uncomfortable conclusion. Imagine for a moment that a young woman finds herself facing an unintended pregnancy, but with the support of her partner, she decides to carry to term. After the birth, their relationship disintegrates. She's alone. She's juggling part-time jobs in schools and struggling financially and mentally. Is her situation hard? Undoubtedly. Should the baby's father be around to share the responsibilities with her? Yes. But in his absence and without a support network, would any of us consider it a good or moral solution to end the life of her infant? I don't think so. Why not? Because it is wrong to intentionally and directly end the life of an innocent human being. Instead, what a pro-life or pro-choice, we would seek to support her. We would seek to address her difficult circumstances and eliminate her suffering, not eliminate her newborn New, newborn son or daughter. My question is this, why then, when we're dealing with a similarly difficult situation where the woman is pregnant, would we allow for eliminating her preborn son or daughter? Obviously, some of you are going to say that my analogy is flawed. The embryo or fetus is not fully developed yet, you might say, which is true. The law doesn't recognize the embryo or fetus as a human being with human rights, you might say, whereas the infant obviously is recognized as such. And again, you're right. But what that shows us is that at the heart, at the root of the abortion debate is this question. What or who are the preborn? Are they human or are they not? If they're not, I am in the wrong. But if they are human, shouldn't they have human rights? If they are human, abortion kills the youngest and most vulnerable members of our species and is therefore a human rights violation. Now, in the next rounds and discussion, which has already been mentioned, we are going to answer various questions. And what I will do is make a scientific case for the humanity of preborn children. And here's why. If they are not human, no justification for abortion is necessary. But if they are human, no justification for abortion is ever adequate. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Micah. That was that was great. Um, one heck of a, an introduction, I must say. Um, yes, thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Fellows, uh, your opening statement now. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Shamul and Nina, for uh, orchestrating this event. And I apologize for others who also worked hard to orchestrate this uh, meeting of Micah and I to discuss uh, this, as Micah said, a very important topic that affects uh, everyone. Um, I will speak about, uh, from my own perspective as an abortion provider for many years. I have to add that uh, you'll see my head down while uh, up until two days ago, I thought we were also being uh, using slides uh, to refer to while we're talking. So uh, my slide selection has been eliminated and I'm now uh, bobbing down periodically to look at my notes. So I'd like to start off with a disclaimer. Um, I think that it is reprehensible that women continue to fight for their abortion rights in 2021, no less. It's particularly dismaying when no society has granted the fetus personhood. On March the 16th of this year, 2021, the World Health Organization released some very disturbing statistics. Nearly one in three women are subjected to physical or sexual violence in their lifetime. Pervasive criminal behavior that has increased during the pandemic. 31% of women aged 15 to 49, or 852 million, have experienced sexual or physical violence in 2018. Husbands or intimate partners are the most common perpetrators. One quarter of adolescent girls aged 15 to 19 in relationships have also been subjected to physical or sexual violence. Compare this problem to our one in a century pandemic 120 million COVID cases worldwide. 
this is one seventh of the problem of physical and sexual abuse to women. Women are under siege worldwide. Societies must address these serious women's issues, not further suppress them. To give a further perspective, each day in the world, uh, in the life of the world, there are approximately 100 million acts of sexual intercourse. From this, approximately 910,000 conceptions, 150,000 therapeutic abortions, and 500 women will die from criminal abortions on that day, or 176,000 women will die per year from criminal abortions. Now I'd like to give a brief historical perspective on abortion provision. Therapeutic abortions have been a choice for women in most European countries since the mid 1950s. In the United States of America, Roe v. Wade in 1969 heralded the arrival of choice in the United States and Canada adopted the same posture at that time. In 1989, Canada decriminalized abortion, so there were no laws governing the provision of abortion. In 2003, it was reported that there were worldwide 42 million abortions out of 205 million pregnancies. The highest rate of these abortions occurred in countries like the Soviet bloc, uh, Estonia, Bulgaria, Latvia, and the rate of abortion has the same incidence whether a country has legalized it or not. The abortion rate is declining in countries where it is legal, but it is not in countries where it is illegal. Illegal or unsafe abortions result in 5 million women hospitalized to treat complications from criminal abortions per year. Women will be desperate enough to end a pregnancy that they will actually drink turpentine. Now I'll give you a little story about abortion in Romania. The American Journal of Public Health published many years ago an article analyzing maternal mortality during the period of 1980 to 89 in Romania. This interval coincided with the Ceausescu husband and wife leaders of the country who outlawed abortion and contraception and took steps to enforce these laws. These included mandatory pelvic exams at places, pregnancy testing, and basically police surveillance. The consequences of this and its enforcement are the following. Along with the increase in maternal mortality compared to other European or Asian countries, the social impact realized in women not having access to abortion, to abortion was the bearing of unwanted children who were placed in institutions because their families could not find the means or motivation to care for them. Approximately 150,000 to 200,000 children met this fate. As well, the Romanian street, street children evolved where at a certain age, the children were discarded into society to fend for themselves. Subsequent to the demise of the Ceausescu's and their laws, the maternal mortality rate fell 50% in one year, having been 30 times higher than any other European country during that same interval. Whose choice is it? I'm an ardent advocate of freedom of expression and protest, not to protest a woman's right to choice, rather society's failure to assist in the prevention of unplanned and unwanted pregnancies. What I mean by this is we have the infrastructure, the financial and educational wherewithal to significantly reduce our abortion. Yeah, we're going there for coffee now because he had to teach. We had to teach today because we weren't in Florida after all. Sorry, what was that? Somebody was talking about going for coffee. Sorry. Uh, what I mean by this is we have the infrastructure the financial and educational wherewithal to significantly reduce our abortion rate. In Canada, there are approximately 100,000 abortion, therapeutic abortions per year, 14 per thousand in the 15 to 44 year age group. 
We need to lobby or protest that women should be able to access safe, effective contraception, thereby protecting themselves from unplanned and unwanted pregnancies. Protesting abortions should embrace the promotion of prevention by encouraging patients to educate their children with respect to contraception and sex education, improving educational opportunities in our schools, educating our vulnerable population regarding harm reduction related to drugs, alcohol, and sexual assault. Make the tools of prevention more accessible. Protesting abortion increases our awareness that we have failed much of the population that seek an abortion. Lastly, on the topic of protest, I do not endorse the targeting of patients seeking abortions, clinics providing abortions, or abortion providers. I do endorse the use, I do, sorry, I do not endorse the use of inflammatory rhetoric or pictures, which we know can incite unspeakable violence. Take, for example, what's going on in these very days in the United States of America. No government interest group, man or woman, has a right to an individual's choice. I fervently endorse a woman's right to choice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fellows. Uh, that was great. Thank you so much, both speakers, for your opening statements. Uh, those were amazing, honestly. Um, all right, well, I'll, uh, I'll move to the first question. Um, so this question goes to Maika. Um, as I asked before in my excitement, um, at what point, and this is such a crucial question when it comes to this debate, but at what point do you consider that human life begins? Because it is at that question where it becomes about whether or not it's human rights. So what do you think? Where do, at what point does uh, a fetus have come to life? And how Thank you for asking that question. Like I said in my opening statement, uh, this is where I would give the case for the humanity of preborn because that is what determines whether or not they should have human rights. Now the question I would ask is this one, when two human beings reproduce, what species will their offspring be? Well, since species reproduce after their own kind, if the parents are human, obviously their offspring is going to be human as well. That's basic biology. You don't have to even study biology to know that. But of course, the question is, when does that human life, that human being begin his or her life? Well, I would encourage you to check out textbooks that are commonly used by medical students across the country and internationally. In fact, one of my brothers is in medical school and I have seen him use one of those very embryology textbooks. And so I could give you many examples, but for instance, Moore, Persaud, and Horchia say in their textbook, The Developing Human Clinically Oriented Embryology, the following, and this is a quote, human development begins at fertilization when a sperm fuses with an oocyte to form a single cell, the zygote. This marks the beginning of each of us as a unique individual. Like I said, I could cite many more sources. For example, also Dr. Maureen Kondik's white paper on when human life begins. And she makes the case that not only does human life begin at fertilization, but it begins at the beginning of, of fertilization, which is a 24 hour process approximately. And she distinguishes here between sperm cells and egg cells and embryos and how they are different in their composition and in their behavior. And that's how we can determine that a one cell embryo is fundamentally different from a sperm cell and an egg cell. So the sperm cell and the egg cell are parts of a whole human being, but the zygote, the one cell embryo is a whole human being which directs his or her growth from within. So the simple fact is this, if you do your research, you'll find that there is scientific consensus about the fact that at sperm egg fusion, a new, unique, genetically distinct human organism comes into existence. So scientifically, that's when your and my life began. That's when everyone's life begins. Now, some of you might say, wait a minute, but it's not alive yet. Like that one celled embryo, that's not living. And so let me ask you this. If something is growing, isn't it alive? 
And so when we look at a one cell embryo, the rapid cell division from one cell to two, to four, to eight, to 60, and so forth, tells us that it is growing. And because it is growing, we know that it is alive. Also, if the embryo wasn't alive, you wouldn't need abortion. If the fetus wasn't alive, you wouldn't need abortion. It is the abortion procedure which puts an end to the growth and to the life of an individual human being. Now, I recognize that it's hard to imagine that our life started as a one-celled embryo and that we feel no emotional connection to a one-celled embryo. But that doesn't change the facts. In my opening statement, I said, we should follow the facts where they lead us. And so essentially, there's no difference between a larger embryo or a larger fetus from a one-celled embryo. We have to ask what it is. It's a human embryo because the parents are human. It's a living embryo because he or she is growing. It's a unique embryo. No one like that has ever been there before and no one will ever be like him or her again. So to answer the question very simply, human life starts at fertilization as science shows us. Thank you so much for that, Micah. Um, now begins the rebuttal. Uh, Dr. Fellows, do you have a rebuttal uh, to that? Well, I will give my answer to that question rather than specifically rebuttal what Micah just said, and perhaps it will do, th do that at the same time. Absolutely. Um, so from my perspective, and I think um, any literature that I have read uh, in terms of what constitutes a human life, um, it begins at birth. After the fetus exits the woman's body and takes a breath. If the fetus exits the human body and does not breathe, it is called a stillbirth. It's called a fetal death. Birth means the beginning or the start in the context of a human life. The emergence of the fetus, a new individual from the body of its parent that breathes, is it's coming into existence. If the fetus does not breathe, as I said, it's declared to be a fetal death or a stillbirth. We don't count a human age from the moment of conception. Age of the human begins at birth. The gestational ages uh, that constitute uh, a potential living human are anywhere after 20 weeks pregnancy or 28 weeks pregnancy. Prior to this, it is de defined as an abortion and it can weigh anywhere from 500 to 750 grams. There is no ambiguity about the exiting of the mother's body and breathing as a definition of the human birth or human being. The fetus has never achieved personhood in any uh, society that's on this earth at this time. That's all I have to say about it. Thank you so much, Dr. Fellows. Um, now we go in for rebuttaling. Um, Can I have a response like, uh, to Dr. Fellows? Yes, do you have a response? Yeah, so my question to Dr. Fellows would be this one. Um, if our lives don't start until birth, then, and, and if our human existence doesn't begin until the moment of birth, what's existing before the moment of birth? Uh, Dr. Oh, maybe we can leave, maybe we can leave his microphone on so we can go back and forth. Yeah, there you go, thank you. There we go. So sorry, I, I, would you mind repeating that, Micah? Sorry. I yeah, so, so you said, if I understand you correctly, that human existence doesn't begin until birth. Correct. So what is existing before the moment of birth? A pre-human being. So we know that it is a fetus, which is what you refer to it as well. Yes. But the fetus has to be of a species. Since the parents are human, doesn't that make the fetus human as well? It's a fetus of the human species, yes. Correct, so a human fetus. Yes, a fetus. Right. The important thing there is that it's a fetus and it's not a human being. It's a so fetus, fetus in the making. Is, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Sorry, it's a fetus, it's a human in the making. 
So, so fetus, as I'm sure you know, but just for the audience's sake, fetus is Latin for young one. It's simply an age classification. That's what we call members of our species from eight weeks of pregnancy until the moment of birth. Before that, we call it an embryo. After birth, we call it an infant, then a toddler, then a teenager. Those are age classifications. So by saying it's just a fetus, you are only telling us how old it is, not what it is. But in order to know what it is, we have to ask who the parents are, which we know are humans. So this is a familiar road that we are traveling down right now, Micah. And I think we've come to a fork in the road where I have to um, tell you that in the context of what we're talking about, therapeutic abortion, we are talking about a woman who has come to a fork in her road and facing one of the, probably the, if not the, one of the biggest crises that she will ever have to face as a human being, the decision to either carry on or terminate a pregnancy. And in my vast experience in talking to and counseling women in this area, I can tell you that no one, no woman, wantonly does this. No woman goes to, gets pregnant with the idea that they want to have an abortion before they get pregnant. They become pregnant usually unknowingly, unwantingly, or enforced by someone else. So we can argue, we can, sorry, we can discuss intelligently uh, about the area that you're talking about, the semantics around fetus versus newborn versus uh, embryo, and how many cells it is. But in reality, um, our society, I believe, has deemed that a woman needs to be heard when she becomes pregnant unwantingly um, and wants to end that pregnancy. Can I just, can I just yeah. respond and bring it back Sorry, to the question? I, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so I acknowledge that many women face difficult circumstances which lead them to abortion. I acknowledge that in my opening statement as well. Um, it should it should be mentioned that abortions of convenience happen as well. The Guttmacher Institute of Planned Parenthood um, says it as well. Um, but I don't deny that many of the circumstances are very difficult. Now, of course, the moral question is, can we solve difficult circumstances during pregnancy by ending the life of an embryo or a fetus? Well, that depends. That depends on if that fetus or if that embryo is a human being like you and me. And I just want to read to you um, just one more quote, for example, um, it, know about the embryo being a human being from an embryology textbook the development of a human begins with fertilization a process by which the sperm from the male and the oocyte from the female unites to give rise to a new organism the zygote so scientifically we know that it's a human being i just wanted to briefly respond to what you said about personhood i didn't make the case for the pre-born being persons like you and me because personhood is a legal and philosophical concept. And throughout history, personhood has been used to exclude human beings rather than include them. I mean, uh, in the eyes of the law, it was said in the Virginia Supreme Court decision, the slave is not a person. Um, the American Law Review said in 1881, an Indian is not a person within the meaning of the constitution. Women were not considered persons and therefore could not vote. Uh, the Reichsgericht in Germany did not consider Jewish human beings and people to be persons. And currently, the law of Canada does not recognize the unborn child as a legal person possessing rights. So I didn't go to personhood route. I didn't say that they are persons because that's a legal and philosophical concept that's actually discriminatory in history. I simply have said they are human beings. Shouldn't it logically follow then that they should have human rights? Um, and that's time uh, for Micah. Uh, okay. Dr. Fellows, you do still have three minutes to respond. Um, you know, this is all well and good what you, what you say, Micah. Um, and respectfully, I would say that you have done a lot of work to um, find information that would um, support um, your uh, posture on women not having choice. Um, but I just would tell you, um, I as a clinician caring for the patient cannot turn a blind eye, a blind eye to 
the very compelling, absolutely devastating information that I read to you in my introduction about what happens to women when you deny them this choice. They don't care about anything except ending this pregnancy. And what I said to you, what I said to, the, to our audience in the introduction was that we can do better than abortion. Absolutely, I agree. And I think that it's very important that we have people like yourself and others who are prepared to, to point out that yes, there is a living organism inside this woman. Um, and it really is, um, you can get a hundred different opinions from different experts on terms of what it is that's growing inside the woman. The bottom line is that there's a huge fire burning in this woman's belly and it isn't because of the pregnancy per se, it's because of the circumstance and, and the fact that she has unwillingly or unwantingly become pregnant and she is desperate by whatever means to end this pregnancy. And I, as a provider of abortions, am witness to this many, many times, thousands and thousands of times in my career. So I know how they feel. I've talked to them. We have counseled them about their options. And I can tell you that up to 15% of women will, with counseling, change their mind, which is a good thing. That's fine. But, you know, 85% of them want an abortion and they will get it by hook or by crook. And that's time. Thank you so much, Dr. Fellows and Micah. That was a very interesting first round. Uh, I love the direction that this is going in. Um, Nina, would you like to ask the second question to Dr. I would love to. So it was interesting to see what you guys, how you guys talked about um, the fetus and human rights and um, when life begins. And so Dr. Fellows, starting with you, I was curious to ask. Sorry, at, excuse me, Nina. You're, yes. you're sorry. You're breaking up a lot. I don't know whether I'm the only one, but you're in, you're, you're staticky when you're talking. So. Uh, it is a little. Okay. Just, How is it now? Can I keep still keep talking? Okay. So, um, Dr. Fellows, I wanted to start off with you, and um, I just wanted to ask: At what point? If at all, should a fetus have rights? I think that uh, as, a, as a blanket statement, um, fetal rights are preempted by the woman's rights. And basically in any society that I've been aware of, the fetus has no rights. Um, Having said that, there are circumstances in Canadian law where the unborn has been made a ward of the children's aid so that procedures can be carried out on the pregnant woman to save the fetus's life. The circumstances are a condition called fetal RH isoimmunization. It has to do with incompatible blood types or sorry, not blood types, but incompatible RH status. So the, um, the mom, mom is RH positive, uh, sorry, RH negative, and the fetus is RH positive. So the mother and the dad have different RH uh, fa factors. The mom has no RH factor and the baby has the RH factor and the fetal blood escapes into the mother's system as it does in any pregnancy, but the mother's immune system responds and destroys fetal red cells. So in this case, the fetus can be saved by be being given a transfusion. So there are precedents in North America and probably worldwide where the fetus is made a ward of the children's aid and uh, the procedure is carried out to transfuse the fetus with RH negative blood so that it can survive till the end of the pregnancy. I think that the last thing I'll say about this is that 79% of Canadians support a woman's rights preempting those of the fetus. They support a woman's right to choose the outcome of her pregnancy. In other words, that the fetus has no rights. All right, thank you, Dr. Fellows. Micah, what are your thoughts on this question? 
Well, we obviously went there a little bit already in the last uh, question. And um, I have argued that if science shows us that the preborn are human beings like you and me, then it only logically follows that they should have human rights as well. And we can learn from history. I mean, the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights was written in 1948 on the heels of World War II. Why? Because it had become very obvious what happens when you base human rights on anything other than our shared humanity. And so that declaration says that everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, every member of the human family. And science supports that to say that not only fetuses, because that's what the question was about, but also embryos are humans like you and me. Now, I find it really interesting that Dr. Fellow says that, um, you know, there, there um, shouldn't be fetal rights or that it's not a human until birth because um, he himself does not do or did not do, I understand you're retired now, um, did not do abortions after 23 weeks and six days. If that was not a human being after 23 weeks and six days up until the moment of birth, why wouldn't abortion have been okay up until nine months of pregnancy? Aside from that, um, about the RH uh, negative and positive thing, that's really interesting and personal to me because that is actually my exact situation. Um, so during pregnancies, I have had to go to the hospital for uh, Rogam injections and to make sure that my baby can um, you know, stay alive and so that there's no issue with that. But it's so interesting that we can somehow want or seem to have it both ways. On the one side, we're doing what we can to protect preborn children. Um, just recently, I saw a poster that talks about the impact, the harmful impacts that cannabis can have on preborn children, on your embryo and or on your fetus. I saw that at my local health unit. And so that it would be wise not to use cannabis while pregnant. At the same time, we can have abortions in our country. That's cognitive dissonance. That's having two ideas that can't exist together. Either they're human beings and cannabis and smoking and, and other things can harm them, but then abortion certainly harms them because it ends their life or they are not human beings. And we don't have to concern ourselves with what we do during pregnancy, with their rights, with, you know, Rogam injections or anything of that sort. But we have to choose. We can't have these two ideas that aren't compatible with each other. Thank you so much, Micah, for sharing your response. Dr. Fellows, do you have any, um, any rebuttals? Um. As a matter of fact, I do. Um, uh, Micah said that, that the fetus is a human being like you and I. Uh, I don't know whether you've seen uh, what a 12 or 14 week fetus looks like. Um, they certainly don't look like you and I. And from a physiological point of view, they are well behind you and I. They cannot survive. And in fact, uh, up until 23 weeks and six days, it is extremely rare for a fetus to have to be intact and survive uh, if it's born uh, at or before that interval. Uh, to Micah's point about doing abortions up until 23 weeks and six days, yes, in Canada and in many European countries, um, there are no laws governing when pregnancies cannot be ended, but in these countries, Canada and European countries, France and England in particular, um, pregnancies are not terminated after that time because of the possibility that the fetus might survive, albeit rarely intact after that time. Um, and this may change in the future. Right now, our society condones abortions up until that period of time. The law doesn't have anything to do with it. It's what society and pediatric colleagues, uh, neonatologists deem as a reasonable cutoff point to afford um, the opportunity of a newborn were it to be delivered um, after 23 weeks and six days to survive in this on this earth. But prior to that time, Although the 
external appearance of the fetus is very much like you and I after about 16 weeks. Its ability to survive uh, in this, on this earth is virtually impossible. So I know Micah likes to, to point out that the fetus is like you and I, but it is in no way like you and I um, prior, prior to uh, 23 weeks and six days and surviving on this earth. Can I respond to that? Sure. Yeah, okay. Um, so what you've done, Dr. Fellows, is bring up differences between embryos and fetuses um, who are not born or who are younger, uh, for sure, and those of us who are born yet. Now, I acknowledge that those differences exist. When I say there are human beings like you and I, I'm talking about them being a member of our species. Obviously, they are smaller than us, they're in a different location than us, but since when do our human rights change based on how big or how small we are, based on our location, based on how developed we are, or based on technology? Because as technology continues to improve and, and pre-born children, or rather born children, preemies, can survive at an earlier and earlier age, does that mean that our human rights will continue to evolve or, or be based on the technology or on society's view or on the CMA's guideline? I mean, if, if a 12 week or a fetus rather does not look like us or does not look like what we think a human being should look like, we shouldn't be surprised. I mean, we'd be very surprised if a newborn child would look like an adult or a senior. That's what you're supposed to look like in human development at that age. And um, I showed a, a, a medical model when I did my opening statement. And many people do not know that at 12 weeks of pregnancy, this is an accurate depiction, both size and weight of a 12 week uh, fetus. If we're talking about a little bit later, like 20 to 22 weeks, um, this, this is a medical model at that age. So these are the children that you refer to that can be aborted because they are just fetuses and, and they are not human until they are born. And so I would question if you look at these children, some of which have survived outside the room, like the youngest preemies that have been born, um, are they not human like us? Should they not have human rights? Can I respond? Yeah. Yes, you do have three minutes for that. <laughs> okay. Once again, we divert from the issue here, I think. The issue for me as a gynecologist and obstetrician is not the fetus, not the unborn, but the woman who's in front of me who has conceived either by accident or by force. And what we're not talking about is this huge elephant in the kitchen. The elephant in the kitchen being this woman will take it upon herself to end this pregnancy if our society does not provide her with the wherewithal, the safe wherewithal to end this pregnancy. And so what I would say is that this is a fact. This, this zest, this zeal for women to determine their own fate when it comes to childbirth or not childbirth, that is ingrained in them. They will not carry on in the pregnancy if they don't want to. They will find someone somewhere to end this pregnancy or they'll use bleach or turpentine or whatever they can find to try and abort the pregnancy. So, we as, an, uh, as a society have an obligation to look after these women. Uh, we also, as I said in my introduction, have a, a bigger obligation to try and make sure that they don't find themselves in this position to begin with. And that's where I think our energies need to go, not in trying to restrict their access to abortion, but to help them prevent the need for abortion in the first place. All right, well, that's the end to this round. Um, that was a fantastic round, honestly. Uh, 
keeps getting better. Uh, thank you so much for your answers. Um, so the next question is directed to you, Micah. Um, so the question is, should there be a limit to a woman's right to self-determination in case of abortion? Thank you for that question. Um, I wholeheartedly agree that women like men have a right to self-determination and that this is a good thing. Now, should there be a limit in the case of abortion? First of all, let's look at if there should be a limit at all. The right to self-determination is not an absolute right. It's a conditional right. It all depends on what the choices are that the woman wants to make. And so when we say, should there be a limit, we should look at what the thing is that the woman wants to do. Only then can we determine whether there should be a limit. So there are already limits on our right to self-determination for all of us, not just women. If our choices are going to harm someone else, it's no longer about self. It's no longer about self-determination. It's about another human being. And so in that case, yes, often our right to self-determination is limited. We can look, for example, at, you know, when you are consuming alcohol, which you can do if that's what you want to do. But if you are under the influence of alcohol, which will impair your driving, you cannot then get into a vehicle and drive. So your right to self-determination and bodily autonomy is limited to protect the others around you. So again, the key word here is self. Um, if we look at this past year, we've seen that many of our rights have been limited during the COVID-19 crisis um, in order to protect the vulnerable, many of whom are people we don't know. It's, it's fellow citizens, it's strangers. Our rights have been limited for the greater good. And so, yes, there are limits to our self-determination. To use an analogy, surely we would all agree that a man's rights to self-determination does not include the choice to harm or like Dr. Fellows talks about uh, abuse or sexually assault a woman. Why? Because it's no longer about himself. It's about another person whose rights are being infringed upon. So to bring it back to the question, does abortion impact another human being? Well, in the case of pregnancy, we're talking about two human beings. So in this case, we have conflicting rights. We have the right to life and we have the right to self-determination or bodily autonomy. And the pro-life view is not that we should have special rights for embryos and fetuses. We are simply asking for consistency. What do we say when rights conflict? We uphold the more fundamental right. Can I, as a woman, do um, like continue my life with limited rights to self-determination. Yeah, we all have this past year. So can I give up some of my rights to self-determination so that my child, my offspring, my pre-born child can have the right to life? Yes, I can. Now, can the pre-born child do without the right to life? No, all other rights are redundant um, if you don't first have the right to life. So we're simply asking for consistency. Should there be limits to, to self-determination? If the choice is going to harm someone else, then yes. So in the case of abortion, I think the answer is obvious. Uh, there should be a limit. Thank you so much for that. Um, Dr. Fellows, on to you. So we do somewhat, with all due respect, Michael, we do inevitably in this topic, end up going around in circles a bit but, and covering the same topic many times. But um, I will give a little spiel that I prepared about this particular issue. Firstly, Michael, you mentioned that um, we do, uh, our society has deemed it appropriate to restrict human rights if it impacts on uh, the well-being or the life of another human being. And really that's the, the nub of the issue between you and I here. And, you know, with all due respect, I don't think we can go beyond this impasse um, because you believe fervently in what you believe. And I believe fervently in 
the information that I have uh, presented tonight. And most of this information has nothing to do with me. Fortunately, I'm a male who, uh, with my partner, was never in a position where we did not want the child that we had conceived. Um, so whose body is it? This question is or should be redundant in any society. Canadians and any unoppressed society have decriminalized abortion. Canada did so 32 years ago. In ours and most societies, women have a choice with respect to the continuation or not of the pregnancy. No other individual, interest group or government has control over any of her body functions, including reproduction, just her. All free countries, including Canada, support the concept that the fetus does not become a person until birth. A pregnant uterus or fetus has no legal status in Canada. Society has witnessed women's vehement reaction to being bullied, harassed, assaulted, demeaned from time immemorial. Women and of course men are opposed to anyone usurping control of their bodies in any way, shape or form. As with men, they deserve complete autonomy with respect to all body functions. We, society, governments and men have no right to tell women how to use any part of their bodies, brains, hearts or uteri. Thank you so much. My turn to respond. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that Dr. Fellows and I would agree that um, women can do with their bodies uh, whatever they want in principle, though we just covered that there are limits to that. Um, and he's right. This goes back to the same issue because, like I said, in the case of pregnancy, it's not just my body as a woman. There's a body of another human being inside of me. Now, you can't see this here on Zoom, um, but I'm currently pregnant. And so there are two human beings sitting right in front of you. One is inside my body. And um, that's, and I know pregnancy is not always easy. Um, many people refer to it as beautiful and it certainly is, but it's also hard. If I wasn't pregnant right now, um, I would have had more sleep last night. Uh, I would have more oxygen to talk right now. Uh, I would have more money in my bank account. In fact, I could possibly say that my life would be a lot easier. But when we look at the right to self-determination, I don't believe that women need to kill their pre-born children in order to be free. Women's right to self-determination does not need to include the right to end the life of our vulnerable offspring in order to attain equality. And so that's what we need to look at. Dr. Fellows is right. We'll get stuck at this point every single time, which is why I said, let's follow the facts where they lead us. The children that are inside their mother's bodies are not part of her body. And so just like we expect parents after birth to provide for the basic necessities of life, to provide for the well-being of their children, we are simply asking that pregnant women like myself would do the same. Thank you for that, Micah. Um, Dr. Fellows, would you have an answer to that? Uh, I just have one concerning comment, actually, or uh, comment that causes me great, uh, something that Manka said that causes me great concern. And that is, you know, um, I think it's fair to, to use this analogy. You know, we have heard... Um, we've heard in the United States of America of the atrocities that have happened in the last three days. Um, two amongst others, uh, um, a preponderance, preponderance of women and Asian women being shot because they uh, probably as a hate crime. And you know, part of this um, has to lie in the inciting type of rhetoric that politicians in the states and, and in including Donald Trump 
when they start to belittle and demean um, uh, people of Asian descent because of the coronavirus. And it precedes that as well. I think, as I said in my opening statement, you know, the use of inflammatory rhetoric, um, we are better than using inflammatory rhetoric to make a case. Saying things like kill a preborn child, I think is inflammatory rhetoric. Showing pictures of dismembered fetuses um, to the public is inflammatory rhetoric. And all it does is it incites certain elements in our society to take matters in their own hand. And I just have to reflect on the dozen or so abortion providers in the United States of America who have been killed over the years. And even three abortion providers in Canada severely wounded or injured by zealots who pick up on this inflammatory rhetoric and pictures and decide to take matters in their own hand. Um, I think we have to be very careful to use terminology that is um, less inflammatory. I think you get a heck of a lot further um, using kind words and non-inflammatory rhetoric than you do with inflammatory rhetoric. I think we, we would make greater inroads if it wasn't for these kinds of um, um, inflammatory uh, comments and pictures. That's all I'll say about it. Thank you so much, Dr. Fellow. Sorry, I had to interject because it's uh, time, but that finished off perfectly. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, all right, we move on to the next question now. Um, yeah. oh, before we do, sorry, Nina, just, just one second. This is, I just wanted to make sure that, um, sorry, just wanted to make an announcement to everybody that's uh, putting up questions in the polls. We're getting a lot of questions and it's great. I love that energy. Uh, just wanted to make sure that um, uh, if, if you could just check whether or not the question that you're putting up has already been put up, just so we can avoid a repetition of questions. You can instead vote for the question that you want uh, asked. But yeah, just wanted to say that. Sorry about that. But yeah, Nina, continue. No worries. No, it's good for everyone to know that. So thank you, just, Micah. Of course. I just have one question. I see that it's uh, 10 to 8. I'm not sure what your timeline is. Uh, Mika and I have covered a lot of territory, and I'm wondering if it would be more constructive to go to if you have these many, many questions of our 200 plus audience. I, I don't know what your timeline is, but I imagine it would take us 40 to 60 minutes to get through the questions. What are your thoughts, Mika, about that? Yeah, so we have um, a few more. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I haven't responded yet to your, um, you know, your point about maternal mortality and women dying, because I knew that question was still coming up. So I was hoping we could- uh, Okay, that's fine. I just thought I'd bring it to attention. For that's sure, no, no, that's yeah. a good point. Um, maybe we could just, Keep the answers sh shorter and 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 not as much back and forth. What what do you yeah, uh, moderate your things? Do you, you want do you want to finish off what you have to say, or I'll finish off what I have to say, and then you finish off, or you you go ahead, uh, say actually, what you want. The oh. the good thing is that like we're actually speeding through a little faster than I had anticipated, so we're not going uh, over the marks. So that's okay. that's okay. great. Yeah, okay. so right now, and we're already at the fourth question, and there are seven. So. Okay, Sh that. Shamil, you're the boss. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. And yeah, all right. Well, Nina, take it away. Thank you. So, um, so we've talked a lot about human rights and who should get rights, if the woman should get rights, if the fetus should get rights. Now, this next question is going aside from that. So aside from the legal aspect of the, de of the debate, um, are abortions humane? So Dr. Fellows, this question is directed to you. Okay, um, I have a fairly short answer for this. Humane, the definition of humane is compassionate, benevolent, sympathetic. And for the woman, yes, it's a very humane event for her. Without it, um, in her mind, her life would be changed forever. So is the provision of abortion services humane? 
Absolutely. Obviously, the pregnancy itself for the intrauterine pregnancy, it knows not what it's missed. So we can't use the term humane to describe an object, a living object in the uterus, which is not by definition a human being yet. All right. Okay, so I, uh, my first sentence was the exact same one. I said for abortions to fit the definition of humane, they have to be compassionate. Um, and so I recognize that many who are in support of abortion, including Dr. Fellows, um, are concerned about the well-being of women facing difficult circumstances. So um, in order to, while wanting to be compassionate, they believe abortion to be the solution. But something that is missing from that conversation is some accurate facts about what the abortion actually does. And Dr. Fellows raised the concern of inflammatory rhetoric. I, I, I share his concern. I think that on the one side we have euphemisms, so we can use words like abortuses and stillbirths that hide what the preborn are and what abortion does to them. And on the other side, we have inflammatory rhetoric. I would want to use accurate language and facts. That's what I aim to do. So um, when I say killing a child, I'm speaking about the ending of a human life. That's accurate. That doesn't mean that pro-lifers um, uh, have a judgment of women who've had abortions or of Dr. Fellows who's carried out abortions. We're talking about the act of abortion. So for abortion to be humane, it has to be compassionate. I've shown you some medical models. Um, I wanted to show you one that is 20 to 22 weeks. This is an accurate representation of a child at 20 to 22 weeks of pregnancy, both the weight and the size. For a child to be aborted at this age, you would have to use medical forceps, which Dr. Fellows would be familiar with because of suction and the, the Society um, of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends that you use forceps and, and that you grasp, uh, clasp onto a limb and twist it off and pull it out and keep doing that until finally only the baby's skull is left and then crush down on it until white fluid comes out, which is the baby's brain. You tell me whether that's humane, whether that's compassionate. Just last year, a study came out in 2020 called a comprehensive review of the scientific literature, which was done by both a pro-choice scientist and a pro-life scientist. And they looked at whether preborn children, whether embryos or fetuses, whatever you want to call them, um, can feel pain. And uh, their comprehensive review showed that possibly from 12 weeks on, but certainly from 18 weeks on, the, the systems are in place for a fetus to feel pain. So the abortions that we're talking about will cause pain to children. And I don't know how anyone could say that that's humane. So very interesting points from both speakers, absolutely. Um, Dr. Fellows, would you have uh, a response to that? Um, well, first of all, Mike, I would inform you that uh, the late abortions are carried out by different means now. Uh, the pregnancy is the life of the fetus is terminated and then the fetus is removed. They use uh, digoxin into the fetus, kills it immediately, and then the uh, pregnancy is removed. So the issue of pain is really not uh, any longer uh, on the table in terms of the procedure itself. Secondly, um, I think that um, using Again, using pictures and using narrative and language, which um, describes how the pregnancy is ended, really begs the issue here. The issue here is what about this woman who's sitting in front of you facing, as I said earlier, one of, if not the most important crisis in her life and you are unwilling or unable to help her. She will resort to whatever means. Yes, you can say, well, we can coax her through the pregnancy and give her support. Well, the Ceausescu's, as I pointed out to you, uh, for 10 years denied women choice. And if the woman didn't die from a criminal abortion and did have a pregnancy, these children were put in homes and eventually 
thrown out on the street. You just have to Google Romanian street children to realize what a tragedy, a travesty that was. That was unwittingly an experiment that this couple conducted and it had unbelievable consequences to women and children. So that's all I'll say about it for now. Micah, do you have any final thoughts? Um, yeah, I just found it interesting to note that um, Dr. Fellow said that while forceps are no longer used in that way, the child is killed. He specifically used the word killed um, with the joxin in the heart. Um, that doesn't change the morality of abortion. If we kill someone without pain, does that mean that it's then okay to kill them? Um, secondly, when we talk about killing, I just wanted to point out that we are not just talking about killing because that's what we want to talk about. In fact, we're calling for an end to the killing. I mean, that's the website of our organization. We are calling for an end to the violence. We are calling for peace, uh, both in society and in the womb, um, when we respect the human rights of all human beings. And, and we'll get to your point uh, about you know, the crises that women find themselves in and, and Romania and maternal mortality um, very soon. Beautiful, all right, thank you so much. Um, well, I guess we can move to the next one. Also, everyone, we're basically 70% done with the, with the question and answers, after which we'll reach the audience discussion and bring up the questions from the audience. So yeah, uh, anyone that wants to hit the polls, now's the time to do that. But um, yes, so my next question is to Micah. So in the case of a woman not having the choice to be pregnant, such as in the case of sexual assault, uh, it is currently legal in Canada to undergo an abortion. So what are your thoughts on the morality of the woman having this choice, sorry, the childbearer having the choice? Should it continue to be legal? And if so, if not, why? Yeah, so it's currently legal to have an abortion in Canada for any reason um, at all. But of course, uh, for women in our country, that may be after sexual assault, which has resulted in pregnancy. And I think that the common ground that all of us share is that sexual assault is a horrific injustice and a crime perpetrated on people in our society. And I believe that those who perpetrate that crime should face uh, tougher consequences than they currently are. And when it comes to abortion and the morality in such a, in such a situation, I first just wanna point out that, um, you know, I have, I, I have not personally experienced this. Um, I have walked with some of my friends who have experienced sexual assault. And they have told me that it takes much longer than nine months to get over the trauma of a rape and that of, of sexual assault and that abortion did not or would not have erased that trauma. So that first of all. Now, if someone is pregnant and considering abortion, should that be legally allowed? My question would be this one. If we don't give the death penalty to the guilty perpetrator, which we don't in our country, why should we give the death penalty to the innocent child? In the case of sexual assault, there are two people who are involved, two human beings who have been victimized. And when there are victims, we want there to be less suffering. We want them to become survivors. And so the choice is either we create another victim by ending his or her life, or we help two human beings to become survivors. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Fellows. It's uh, now on to you. I find it very difficult to respond to that, Mika. I think that um, basically what you're suggesting is that if as a result of uh, sexual assault, rape, a woman becomes pregnant, you'd rather not her be allowed to access abortion. Um, I think this is a, a heinous crime to deny a woman this choice and under this circumstance or under any, any circumstance really. Um, and the consequences of this emotionally um, 
are definitely uh, magnified by this woman then being burdened by, for the next however many months, carrying on and producing a child as a result of this malunion, as a result of this criminal assault, is unfathomable to me, untenable. And um, I think that uh, I really can't say anything more about it. I, I don't understand any logic that would deny uh, a woman uh, choice, particularly in this instance. Dr. Fellows, you said that I would rather that a woman not access abortion. I mean, nothing of this, nothing about this is about what I would rather want. I would rather not that any woman would ever have to face such a difficult situation at all. Right. Um, obviously, fairness went out the window the minute a woman was sexually assaulted, both for her and her preborn child. And so we have to ask ourselves, when there's an injustice, how do we respond to that? Do we create more injustice or do we try to do what we can to help all people in the situation? Can I respond? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, if and until our society uh, makes it easier for women to access uh, preventive measures in terms of pregnancy, well, basically, it's the it's the algorithm that I outlined earlier that we as a society can do better than abortion. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, for sure. But if and until we have the wherewithal for any woman to easily access um, birth control, the morning after pill, um, the immediate insertion of an IUD after rape in the prevention of implantation, these sorts of measures until we had them universally available. I think it is untenable that we would deny a woman the right to end a pregnancy. Our society can do better than abortion. You're absolutely right. But we need to put the wherewithal uh, in place to allow women and young, young women and mature women uh, access to contraception. We need to promote um, um, education regarding the prevention of sexual violence and violence against women. And until we get those, those uh, aspects of human behavior um, better dealt with, we are left with the default position of having an abortion as being the only end that's, that's um, humane and compassionate for the woman. I think I have one more brief response. Um, we are very short on time. Okay, we can move on, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hopefully, if uh, if it comes up in the discussion later, we'll absolutely get into it. Sure. Um, Nina, the next question goes yes. to you. Sounds good. All right. So, Dr. Fellows, this is going to be directed towards you to begin the discussion. So, in our country, right, any woman can choose whether or not they can have an abortion for any reason. And that includes the gender of the sex of the child. Now, Dr. Fellows, what are your thoughts on the morality of sex selective abortions? Should this continue to be legal and why? So um, you're absolutely right. Sex selection um, abortions are, um, well, any abortion is not, um, does not enter into our legal system. So a woman has a right to abortion, end of story. Uh, and this right, really is for any reason that she approaches the uh, abortion provider. I think some abortion providers will not provide abortions for this reason. Um, personally, I would do not uh, um, endorse ending a pregnancy for uh, sex selection reasons, except as it pertains to um, genetic diseases such as hemophilia where um, we know that only uh, male fetuses um, will express the, generally express the, uh, the abnormality of a bleeding disorder known as hemophilia. Um, so each abortion provider does have a, in their own, uh, have their own right to confirm or deny doing an abortion. Similarly, if a woman comes to me and she is emotionally unstable. Um, I will 
uh, and the pregnancy options team will assess this person to see whether uh, this person is unstable to the point that they're making a decision that they may not be able to live with in the future. As I said earlier, uh, of those women who make a call to an abortion clinic to terminate a pregnancy, approximately 15% of them change their mind and decide to carry on with the pregnancy. Having said that, 25% of those women ultimately come back and have an abortion. But the point is that with appropriate counseling, um, um, through uh, professional social workers and sometimes uh, psychiatrists, uh, women can be ex examined and, um, and helped in their decision. And occasionally an abortion will not be deemed to be in the interest, uh, the best interest of that patient. Um, but sex selection per se, uh, simply because it's a boy or a girl, I would not perform abortions for that reason. The issue then becomes what's to prevent this patient from going to another doctor and coming up with a different reason, nothing. So ultimately they may, may um, they be able to obtain an abortion by changing the facts. Um, but my, my conscience is that I would not do it for sex selection alone. The other issue is that we do have cultures coming into Canada where sex selection is much more prevalent. And sometimes it's, it's even more important in those issues to have counseling to these patients to help them uh, realize that, you know, it is socially less, if not totally unacceptable for this to occur in a, a Canadian environment. So. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fellows. Micah, what are your thoughts on this question? Well, it's obviously horrifying to think that um, children are being killed, that their lives are being ended because their sex is not the preferred sex of the parents. Um, but if it's wrong to kill a girl because she's a girl, why is it okay to kill that same girl because she has Down syndrome or because the mother is poor or because she was conceived during sexual assaults? I can't wrap my head around the double standard that Dr. Fellows is, is presenting. And, and we went over this in our last debate when um, he said that he wouldn't perform abortions for sex selection reasons. But why does Dr. Fellows think that sex selection is wrong? It's just his personal opinion. It's his own conscience, he just said. But if the fetus isn't a human being, if human life doesn't begin until birth, what's the problem? Would you like to respond to that, sure. Dr. Phillips? <laughs> um, I guess the problem is that in our, in Canadian culture, um, I was born and raised by a family that did not endorse the concept of sex selection. And I won't get into stereotyping certain cultures, but this was the bias, if you like, that I grew up with. And... Um, so it's very difficult for me to uh, to get my head around ending a pregnancy simply because it is one sex or the other. Having said that, I would not prevent this patient from going to another clinic and seeking an abortion uh, through other means. So I have to live with myself. I have to be true to myself. And uh, in that instance, I realize that it is a double standard. And uh, I may go to hell for believing this, but um, my standard is that um, I feel uncomfortable doing an abortion for sex selection alone. There are extenuating circumstances, but um, on the bare fact of sex selection, I am unable to perform that abortion. Mike, okay. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, I, I'm glad. I'm glad that you feel discomfort um, with at least one kind of abortion. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. I just think it's inconsistent with the views you've presented so far. Um, just, just to wrap up this section, my final question would be: 
um, if we don't kill an embryo or a fetus because she's female, if we as a culture reject that, which the majority of Canadians do when pulled, they, they responded that they are uncomfortable uh, with sex selection abortion and don't think that should happen in Canada. How about we just don't kill her because she's a human, regardless of your sex? How about we just respect her life because she's a young and vulnerable member of our species? I just say one more thing. Uh, we were very short on time. Uh, okay. I have like 30 seconds. That's fine. That's fine. I can wait. There, but, yeah. um, I can wait. Okay, perfect. Uh, all right. Well, with that, we're actually at the, uh, the last question for this, uh, for this debate. So with that, I do want to first thank both of you so much for coming here and having this discussion with all of us. Um, and yes, so now the final one. So, and this is to Monica. So abortion is a deeply controversial and divisive issue. And you're both experienced speakers on the subject. So what is something that you have learned from the other side in your experience? Has that changed anything in your view set? Have you learned anything that you didn't know before? How has it changed at all, if at all, for both of you? Micah, you go first. Yeah, I'm glad you asked. Um, in speaking with countless abortion advocates over the years and people who hold a pro-choice view when it comes to abortion, I have found that we share common ground. I have found that many of them or many of you likely on the call um, are deeply moved by the difficult circumstances that girls and women face during pregnancy and want to find a solution to that. Dr. Fellows has brought some of those up and, and we have not been able to get to uh, all of those yet. Um, but I've come to the realization that though I believe the solution is misguided, though I ne will never believe that ending the life of an innocent child um, is a good solution, is a moral solution, is, is at best a band-aid solution to difficult circumstances, um, I've come to appreciate how that, that, that people care. And, and I think there are also um, some who have come up with a thoughtful defense of abortion philosophically. Um, I still don't think they hold water, um, but at the same time, I think I've learned, uh, probably unlike what, what some pro-lifers think, um, that there are both uh, compassionate people and deep thinkers on both sides of the debate. Now, what I've appreciated about Dr. Fellows um, is that he has continued to agree to uh, engage in debate. There are many in Canada who say the debate is closed, um, even just by virtue of the fact that so many people are attending tonight. We know that that is not true. We know that from conversations on the street. Um, so we need to continue having this conversation. And what I continue to look for in my conversations with people who are in favor of abortion is a reason to stop believing that the preborn are not human beings, that they are not members of our species. I am willing to change my position on abortion if someone can prove to me that they are not scientifically human beings like you and me, and if someone can make a case that some human beings should not have human rights. But so far, I have not encountered that yet. Thank you very much, and uh, Dr. Fellows. The last time Micah and I debated this was seven years ago, actually. Correct. So is this, uh, does this mean you're going to have your second child, Micah? <laughs> Um, this is the second pregnancy during your and my debate, um, but oh, no, see. actually, this is my sixth child. Okay, all right. Okay. <laughs> um, I, have, so I my... have three sons and three daughters, so wow. my son is, is uh, 34 weeks in utero. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. So in my experience, discussing abortion with anti-choice groups is important at many levels. Firstly, it's the voice for people to express dissenting opinions. Secondly, inform society that we, that is society, can do better than end pregnancies. We must address the issues that I've explained earlier of preventing unplanned and unwanted pregnancies. I personally am not comfortable 
with abortion as a solution to a woman's problem. I am not proud of the fact that we have, as a society have failed this woman at many levels, whether it's with respect to contraception, sex education, addressing the issues of violence. It's a very much a stopgap measure. Um, and I think in you know discussing these topics with the anti-choice group, it helps me as a provider to have more fuel in, in my fire to address the issues that I mentioned of prevention. So I, 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 I'm not gonna say I enjoy the debating uh, such an important topic, but I feel an obligation to address this topic because obviously both of us have extremely, both side, sides have extremely passionate feelings for this topic. And I think both sides have a point and um, it behooves both sides to, I think, see the common ground, which is prevention. That's it. Well, thank you so much. And with that, I think we've, yes, that's it. We've uh, neared the end of the, the debate. Uh, thank you so much to both speakers for taking out your time and providing us with such an insightful and honestly amazing discussion. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have now entered the final stage of this event where we will be bringing up the audience asked questions. So we've selected the top three from three different categories, three from pro, the pro-choice side, three from the pro-life side, and three neutral questions. So... Yes, we can start with that. Uh, Nina, would you would you like to begin? All right, yes, sure. Awesome. So this question is the pro-choice question and it will be directed to Dr. Fellows. So since there is no biological difference between a baby slash fetus right before birth and after birth, does that mean Dr. Fellows agrees that location inside or outside determines humanity? If a doctor takes a fetus outside the womb to do an operation on the fetus, that then was it briefly a human and then not a human? Okay, um, that's a good question. So the, I, the questions I understand it is uh, um, really when does life begin um, in terms of being in or out of the uterus? And the, I think the difference is that, you know, when, um, a fetus is born, it is not really declared to be a human until it breathes. So if the fetus doesn't breathe, then it is uh, born dead and it is called a stillbirth or a fetal death. To the point about bringing a fetus out of the uterus, operating on it and putting it back into the uterus, that is true, that can happen, that does happen. But the fetus does not breathe, right? The fetus does not initiate respiration. Once it initiates respiration, then um, it will not it it will not be able to go back into the uterus because all of the mechanisms that are associated with the redistribution of circulation of blood in the body changes permanently, and that uh, so that fetus when that happens and it breathes, it is born and it becomes, as long as it's more than 500 grams or 750 grams, it becomes a living human being. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, Maitha, would you like a short response as well? Yeah, Dr. Fellow said that it is not considered a human being until it, or rather he or she breathes. Um, I would just like to correct that by saying that section 223 of the criminal code says that an unborn child does not become a human being in the meaning of the law um, until it has fully exited the birth canal, until it is fully separate from the mother. So when a baby is born not breathing, um, 
it is deserving of medical care. It is, con it is considered a human being at that very moment under Canadian law and should get medical care even if he or she is not breathing. So um, that's actually incorrect. Um, however, we know that there are children born alive after abortion attempts in Canada and are then left to die. That's a, that's a statistic from the CIHI again, um, which, which has that 150 babies in our last fiscal year survived a late-term abortion attempt and were then left to die, which is against Canadian law. Thank you, Micah. That was very interesting. Um, Dr. Fellows, would you like a short rebuttal or should we move on? Sorry, I'll just clarify. Um, I assumed that uh, by that the student's question uh, encompassed that it was had exited the body uh, at birth. So exited the body, the mother's body and breathing is when it becomes a human being. So um, the operation of removing a fetus and reinserting a fetus, I'm pretty sure that they don't remove the whole fetus from the uterus for these surgical procedures. They remove a portion of the fetus that they want to operate on. So um, in that way, they don't allow them to breathe. So uh, it's not really considered to be a human being at, at during these surgical procedures, which are most frequently done for um, neurological abnormalities such as uh, spinal bifida. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I didn't mention exiting the human body because I presumed that, that that was said, but it wasn't. So I apologize for not having the whole definition completely there. Thank you, Dr. Fellows. Um, well, uh, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, so this one is directed to Micah. So the question is, how does one justify forcing life onto someone who has not consented to it? Isn't it more moral to prevent suffering altogether through abortion? Because at many times we find that when it comes to an abortion, there, there's a sense of putting one person's rights over the other. So at what point do you decide being able, just forcing someone's life onto someone who very much has not consented to it? Well, the person who is asking the question, um, and I certainly agree that it is not moral to force life upon someone else. Um, I, I interpret that to mean um, someone who conceived during sexual assault. That woman never consented to having sex in the first place. She also didn't consent to then uh, conceive a child in that situation. So no, that's not moral. Once that situation is the one we're dealing with, horrifically um, and, and, and wrongly so, we need to ask ourselves what the most moral course of action is after that. So is it more moral to then end the life of one of the two parties involved in that horrific situation? Or is it more moral to say, we are now dealing with two human beings who deserve our care and our support, and we're going to help them. We're going to ensure that both become survivors, and we're not going to victimize another human being. So when the question asks, isn't it more moral to prevent more suffering? Um, is it more moral to end the life of a human being who is suffering? No, it's not. Because then we determine as a society that some people who are suffering would be better off dead. And that's what we're saying about a preborn child who has been conceived during sexual assault. And what I briefly wanted to add earlier, but we, we moved on, um, is that uh, there are many women who have chosen to carry their pregnancy to term after sexual, sexual assault, heroically so, and who have told me that that was the only light, the only reason that gave them joy in a very difficult situation. And none of us would say that she then has to parent the child, especially not if, if the child is a visual reminder of what happened to her, although the child obviously uh, can't help that either. But in that situation or many other situations, women have selflessly chosen adoption, um, which is no longer like adoption with past where someone wondered where they came from and didn't have a connection with the bio or genetic parents. Um, and, and, and I've met some of these women and some of their children, and they are very glad with the choice that they made that they did not, uh, upon having been victimized themselves, then victimize their preborn child as well. 
Thank you, Maika. Uh, Dr. Fellows, do you have, would you like to respond? Oh. I needed to be unmuted. Um, you know, Mika, I know that you are aware of individuals who uh, change their mind or are coaxed into carrying on with the pregnancy and, and they feel better about it. We're talking about 100,000 therapeutic abortions a year in Canada. What about the other 999,999 ,999 people who are in this predicament of an unplanned and or unwanted pregnancy, whether it's the result of rape or not, we do not have the wherewithal or the interest in, by society in solving that problem by basically um, encouraging them, for lack of a better word, to carry on with the pregnancy and give up that period of their life for a pregnancy that they will never be part of uh, after it's born. So, you know, I think anecdotal information like this gives people false hope, gives people false ideas as what, of what's to what we can do with a society. I think, as I said many times already tonight, prevention is the way. Thank you so much. Um, all right, Nina, would you like to go on with the next question? Sure, yes, I will go on. Um, so, here, let me just look for those questions. <laughs> so, Dr. Fellows, this was um, one an audience member just shared a personal question. So they said, I was born at 28 weeks and needed help breathing on my own from the very beginning. Did I not exist before? What if a baby is born dead, but is able to be brought back? So you were born at 28 weeks and you had to be resuscitated. So um, you were not dead when you were born, in other words. So you must have had a heartbeat and inevitably, invariably, there would be some respiratory effort either made by you or given for you at birth. Um, so... I think we're talking semantics here. Um, the definition of a stillbirth is a fetus that is born dead. In other words, it has no heartbeat and makes no respiratory effort, nor can it be, be resuscitated to make a respiratory effort. Either that or it's born dead and has been dead long enough that it already shows signs of deterioration as a result of being dead and no resuscitative efforts are made. So. Um, I don't think that, that um, yours was a case of being born dead. I think that uh, had you been born dead without a heartbeat and be unable to be resuscitated probably for six minutes up to six minutes after birth, then um, if that's the case, it was more than six minutes and or um, there was no heartbeat or breathing motions by that baby, that would be a stillbirth. I don't know, does that answer the question? Well, um, thank you for sharing, Dr. Fellows. Um, Micah, what are your thoughts on that question? Um, I think that's probably a good clarification on Dr. Fellows' part that um, a child who was born dead could not have been brought back, but the child was probably alive. I mean, we don't know the situation, obviously, from the question. Um, but what it reminds me of is uh, the question we answered at the beginning, which is when does human life begin? And Dr. Fellow said it doesn't begin until birth. Yet he has talked about stillbirths, babies who are born dead, and fetal deaths. But if the fetus is not alive because it doesn't start living as a human being until birth, how can it die? He's also used the word kill. How can it be killed if it's not a human being who is already alive before birth? So that's, as he was talking, it reminded me of that. It seems like two conflicting uh, pieces of information. Right. 
Any final thoughts, Dr. Fellows? So it's a fetus when it dies. That's why we call it a fetal death. If it dies when it's a newborn, we call it a neonatal death. So that's why I use the term fetal death. In terms of the use of the word killing, that is my bad. Again, that's inflammatory rhetoric and I should not have used that term. Thank you, Dr. Fellows. Um, well, on to the next question then. Um, and this is uh, again uh, to Maika. <clears throat> So in cases where a woman takes all the steps to avoid pregnancy, such as contraception, but still finds herself pregnant because contraception is known to fail at times, is it then fair to force her to follow through with the pregnancy? Okay, so interesting question. Um, we all know that there is no form of birth control or contraception that's 100% effective or reliable. We also all know that sex, one of the purposes of sex, otherwise our species would no longer exist, is reproduction. So when we engage in an act which can cause the creation of another human being through fertilization, through sperm egg fusion, even when we put up signs or, you know, say not welcome here, even if we use contraception and we try to do whatever we can to prevent fertilization from happening, we know factually that it can still happen. So when we consent to a behavior that we know can sometimes result in uh, fertilization, in the creation of a new human being, which is then our own offspring, our own child, we become parents at the moment of fertilization. We then have a child. Is it fair to force her to bring that pregnancy uh, to term, to carry that child to term? Um, look, CCBR is an educational organization and we raise awareness about the humanity of preborn children and the inhumane nature of abortion. And through that education, Canadians are changing their minds about abortion and many of them have also asked us in the meantime, wait a minute, if that's true about when human life begins, and if that's true about what abortion does to embryos and fetuses, what am I going to do Friday night? Or I better start thinking about my relationship if I'm not ready to be a parent. So I would say that it is good to prevent uh, being in a situation where uh, you become a parent at the moment of fertilization, if you are not ready to be a parent. And there's different ways of doing that. Um, but if you're using contraception, we should all be aware that no contraception is 100% effective and that sex can always result in um, us having a child in utero. Is it then fair to the child to be aborted because his or her parents were not ready to be parents yet? Yet here they are. When, we, when there's a new embryo, we become parents of a child. And so we have a responsibility for our pre-born children in the same way that we have a responsibility for our born children. Thank you, Micah. Uh, Dr. Fellows, would you like to respond to that? Um, yeah, I guess my response would be fairly quick. Um, you know, again, Micah is using the word child to describe uh, an intrauterine pregnancy uh, at seemingly at any gestational age. Um, you know, it's, I think it's totally unreasonable for a conscientious person to be penalized because of a failure of a method of uh, contraception that they're using, whether it's a broken condom, a missed pill, a failed IUD, you know, as Alexander Pope said, to err is human. And I think that to penalize a person for the rest of her life over a mistake that um, she didn't believe that she was making, I think it's harsh on the woman. And um, I think our society uh, would be uh, unsympathetic to any group that forced a woman to carry on particularly in that pregnancy against her will. That's Two it. very brief points. Um, I use very specific language for a reason. 
And child simply means offspring. And so when I am pregnant, my embryo or my fetus is my offspring. Even at my age, I am still my parents' child. And I began to be their child at fertilization. Um, the second thing is that I find it very telling that Dr. Fellows thinks of a baby as penalizing a woman when um, I know that not everyone has had the experience that I've had. I've talked about how pregnancy can be difficult, um, but there are many women, not all women, but many women who regret having abortions. And yet women who chose to carry their pregnancies to term and hold their infants, whether they choose to parent them or choose adoption, because there are many people on the waiting list to adopt children um, and who are willing to have an open relationship with the children's bio or genetic parents. Um, uh, though, though those children are not a penalty. Those children are, are, are valued as human beings, uh, as, as, you know, people in our society. Um, so I don't think it's a punishment and I don't think you'll ever regret loving your child. Thank you, Micah. Um, Nina, would you like to ask the next question? I'd like to, could I just respond to uh, Micah? Yes, absolutely. Yes, you can just go ahead. Um, I'm sorry to sort of attack you, Micah, but um, with all due respect, um, you're a little microcosm of experience in talking to women. Um, it seems to define a lot of your um, advice regarding uh, whether to have an abortion or not. And I think we always have to look at the much bigger picture of the fact that at least 100,000 times a year in Canada, women are put into a position, an untenable position. And it's the experience of these women and their motivation and the causation of their unplanned and unwanted pregnancy that I'm reflecting on when I talk about um, outcomes of pregnancy. So yes, you will be able to find anecdotally almost every permutation and combination related to becoming pregnant and pregnancy outcome, but we need to look at the big picture all the time and try not to focus on, I know a woman who did this and this happened. And so everybody should follow the same uh, blueprint. I think that's not, not sound evidence-based advice. Thank you, Dr. Fellows, for that thought. Um, we're just gonna move on to the next question. And so, in fact, Dr. Fellows, this is directed to you as well, this starting question. So, Dr. Fellows, if life begins at the moment of birth, why is it that life would begin earlier for others if they are born prematurely? Um. Well, you're, you're born when you exit the woman's body and you're considered a live birth if you breathe and have a heartbeat. So I don't think there's any conflict in, in that definition. Um, babies are born prematurely. Um, if Mika was to have her baby now at 34 weeks, he would be he would his life would begin age-wise from the day he was born um so i don't think i don't think there's any conflict am i, am I missing the point there mika can you uh what are your sure yeah you yeah no i think that's fair um um i think what dr fellas has done is is explained so so that's consistent with what he said earlier um, if he considers human life to begin at birth, and whether you're born at 28 weeks or 34 weeks or um, 40 weeks of pregnancy, um, according to his view, that's when your life begins. Is that correct, Dr. Fellows? Yeah, according to not just my view, and according to you know, textbook views, that's when life begins, when you're born uh, you know, after 20 weeks or 500 grams, or in some situations 28 weeks and 750 grams if you're born after that and you breathe and you have a heartbeat you're considered to be a live birth 
Now, I'd be very interested in seeing these textbooks because in my review of embryology and biology textbooks, as I said, and I just gave two examples, um, every single one of them uh, says that human life begins at fertilization, not at birth. So the fact that we in our society start counting, um, you know, your years at birth in itself doesn't disprove the fact that the preborn are human beings. In fact, when we say that a pregnancy is nine months, we we uh, acknowledge that nine months prior to that, something so significant took place that that's when we start counting. And so. Um, just because our, our culture has has this uh, habit of, of, you know, starting your years when you're born, doesn't mean that before that human beings do not exist. In fact, when I talk about my children, um, I'd, like I said, I have six children. My youngest is in utero right now, um, but he's very much alive. He's very much a human being, and he began his life at fertilization. Thank you, uh, speakers. Um, so... Right, so this is the last question that is of either side. After this, Josephine, who is the president of HNMLS, is going to ask three questions that are from pretty much a neutral stance. Um, but till then, here's the last question. This is directed to Maika. So why does it matter if the uh, zygote or embryo or fetus is human? No human has the right to use or damage anyone else's body. So why should it get extra rights? and in a way more rights than the carrier themselves? Great question. So why does it matter um, whether the preborn are human or not? Because basic human rights doctrines hold that you have human rights if you are human, not human plus X, not human and developed up to a certain point, not human and having the ability to be viable outside the womb, not human and, you know, add whatever it is, but just simply being a member of the human family. So since as Canadians, we believe in human rights, since history shows us what happens when we deny human rights to some members of the human family, the main question we then need to answer is um, what are the preborn? And if they are humans, they are deserving of human rights as well. I think it's kind of a two part question because the second part is no human gets to use or damage um, another human's body. And uh, in our species, it so happens to be um, that when you're of that age, that's where you're supposed to be. When I'm looking at the organs in my body, uh, there's one of them, which is the uterus that is in my body for someone else's body. It's not there for me. It's there for my offspring. It's there for children who are conceived and, and who um, end up implanting in the uterine lining. And so um, naturally, that's where very young human beings ought to be. So when we say uh, nobody else gets to use uh, the body or you know, of, of another human being, well, that's what parents do for their children. Even when my son is born in several weeks, hopefully, I will still have to use my body to take care of him. So if I breastfeed him, he uses my body. If I hold him and give him a bottle, he uses my body. Or if his dad does, or if other people do, or if people who become guardians, or let's say someone chooses adoption. So parents use their bodies to provide for their offspring. And early on in our existence as human beings, that is the organ inside the body of the woman uh, that provides for that child. So that's not harming a woman's body, that is simply using the organ that's there for an embryo or a fetus at that stage of human development. Uh, Dr. Fellows, would you like to answer? Um, you know, unfortunately, Shimu, I the first part of the question and what and Mika's response was, I don't know, something happened to my reception. Oh. I'm, out, I'm out in the country. Can you repeat the question for me again? Absolutely. Just one second. Let me just pull it up real fast. Okay. So the question is, why does it matter if the, if the zygote or the embryo or fetus is a human? Because no human has the right to use or damage anyone else's body. So why does it get those extra rights? So in a way, why does its rights kind of overshadow the rights of the carrier themselves? 
Yeah, well, I mean, this is, we've answered this question uh, several times tonight. I mean, <clears throat> from my perspective, the, the fetus, the intrauterine pregnancy has no rights until it's born. And I don't know of any society per se that advocates differently um, in terms of the fetus or the unborn child having any rights. There are, as I mentioned to you, exceptions where humans take it upon themselves to intervene on behalf of the intrauterine pregnancy, but those are anecdotes that are very, very few and far between worldwide. And generally speaking, um, the, our posture, the posture of Canadian society is um, that mother's rights or women's rights preempt the rights of the unborn fetus. Well, thank you so much. Um, well, that brings us to the end of the cited questions. Uh, Josephine has three more questions that don't essentially have a, like a cited stance. Um, so for this, um, whoever wishes to answer first, you may go ahead. It's, they're not necessarily directed to anyone, but yeah, they're just three short questions and that'll be it then. Mm -hmm. Josephine, would you like to come in? Yes, okay, so the first question we have is, in medical emergencies, whose life should be of the priority? The mother or the fetus where only one can be saved. So I go ahead, Dr. Fellows, that's your field. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Micah. Um, whose mother should be saved? Well, you know, it's the it's it's a it's a difficult question and it's not a simple mother versus fetus answer. Really, it depends on the circumstances of what causes what is causing one or both of them to uh, be in a position where their lives are at risk. You know, it reminds me of, of what you're told when you're um, in a boat and uh, you have uh, your children with you and uh, you're advised that if the boat capsizes, make sure you have your life preservers on. But if you don't, put yours on first before you put your child's on because, um, you know, you can't save the child um, without saving yourself first. So I realize there's some variations of that, but so as a general principle, um, you know, the the mother would take precedent over the fetus, but if the mother is obviously going to die, then we would, we would uh, direct our energies towards the fetus. Um, this is of course a classic question that is asked in this kind of debate. And I can tell you that it is very rare that it actually comes to fruition on a clinical, uh, on a clinical basis. Um, yeah. I don't have anything else when to you say. Said they were, sorry, when you said there were three quick questions, this is one we could talk about all evening. <laughs> I know, um, I know, yeah. <laughs> Um, about but that. Uh, aside from that, um, I'll try to be brief uh, with my thoughts about that. So the first thing I would say is that this is only a dilemma if we are speaking of two human lives. If we are not, clearly we would prioritize the mother's life because the fetus is not a human being. So why would this even be a dilemma? So the fact that we need to consider it indicates already that we're talking about uh, a fetus, about a human fetus, a young member of our species. And it's, it's a dilemma precisely because of that. Um, obviously parents will make different choices in situations like that. There may be mothers who, who would forego cancer treatment so that um, their preborn child has a better chance at surviving and, and no one can make that call for them. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is that this is a dilemma that talks about who should we try to save, which is very different from abortion, in which we are talking about, do we actually get to kill? Do we get to end a life? So in this kind of a situation, we are trying to determine who we save, and that's because we value lives. So that's, that's, I mean, that's a good thing. And then finally, um, Dr. Fellows is absolutely right. I mean, he's, he, this is obviously more his field than mine. 
Um, but in you know, the decade or so of pro-life work I've done and research I've done, um, it is uh, a, a not a situation that, like he said, comes to fruition um, as often as we might think. However, uh, it is always wrong to kill one person, to end the life of one person, an innocent person, in order to save the life of another. So from a pro-life perspective, we would oppose ending the life of uh, either the mother or the fetus in order to save the life of the other. But thankfully, there are medical interventions that we can use, um, which means we might be able to save one, um, possibly not two, but that's very different from ending one life. We're trying to save a life. And the side effect of that might be that the other person dies, but not because we ended their life directly and intentionally. Thank you so much. And uh, before we go on to the next question, I do uh, want to say something. Uh, Nina, would you like to tell everybody about the open discussion and chat room that we're having after, after the event? Sure. So um, I know that a lot of people would probably like to debrief or have conversations about what's going on after the debate, maybe even possibly with us here, with some other people. And so um, after the debate is over, we are actually having a chance to we can stay and we're going to host some breakout rooms and um, from there we will be able to have comp free for all conversations with one another about the debate if you have any questions we can ask one another and simply have a conversation about it so if you are at all interested in that stick around after the next few questions also just so the speakers know absolutely we're not <laughs> going to pressure you to stay at all don't worry we're so glad that you were able to make any time at all uh, but yes if you would like to stay feel free to i'm like everyone would love that but of course if you have to go uh, and most of us also have to go uh, through the executive team but this is mostly because especially at sfs we it's kind of like tradition where after each event we have just some time where people openly talk and share their views so yeah just to stick with that, that's what it is. So anyone that would like to uh, from, from here, uh, do stick around and Nina will direct you. But yes, uh, now back to Josephine, sorry. Oh, sorry, just, Michael. Uh, thank something? you for the invitation. And I just wanted to say, this is the best uh, hosted online event I've been part of. So great job. Thank you so much. That means the world to us. Thank you. Sorry, okay. Thank you so much, Micah. But um, for the second question, yeah. it is, we know a zygote doesn't have consciousness. So how does an abortion hurt the fetus as it wouldn't know the difference between living and not living? Can I take that one first? Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. So uh, the question is about the consciousness of a zygote, of a very young embryo, um, which is a fair uh, concern to raise. And so I would say that an embryo by virtue of being a member of the human species has the inherent, inherent capacity to uh, have consciousness. It just doesn't have the immediately exercisable capacity yet. So why is it that the embryo the zygote doesn't have consciousness yet? Because he hasn't had the time yet to develop it, yet, to develop it. Um, time is reflected in our age. So he's simply not old enough yet to be conscious um, in the same way that young children don't have other capacities yet that they inherently do because they're humans, but they cannot exercise them yet because they're not old enough yet. And so if we're going to deny human rights based on abilities that the, the embryo or the fetus doesn't have yet, that are related to our age, we are discriminating against them based on age or based on ability or based on function. And so I would say uh, there are abilities that embryos don't have later yet. There, there are abilities that fetuses don't have later yet, but they will if we just leave them in the place where they're supposed to be. So even if they're not aware of the fact that their life is being ended, that in itself doesn't change the morality of the abortion procedure, which does end their life. Uh, Dr. Fellows, would you like to respond? Um, I really don't have much to say. Um, and we're talking about uh, an embryo. We're talking about uh, one or two cells uh, say, size. Whatever size we're talking about, we're talking about um, a, an intrauterine pregnancy which has no status. So um, 
I continue to uh, wave that as the flag of, of the woman who wants to choose to end a pregnancy, that what's growing inside her has no status in our society and we will comply with her wishes. Thank you so much. Okay, awesome. Thank you for your responses. So our final neutral question is, in light of advances in prenatal screening and developmental bio and genetics, how would you address the potential practice of eugenics, thus eliminating individuals, say with dyslexics, ADHD and autism? The question is open to answer, be answered by either of you. I think it's your turn to go first, Dr. Fellows. No, you do a better, much better job at answering these anecdotes, these impromptu <laughs> questions, but I will go first. Um, yeah, I think that um, eugenics will definitely change how we, uh, how patients um, manage their pregnancies and, and it will help that, to determine whether or not they um, continue or terminate a pregnancy based on the kind of abnormalities that are that are, de are being dealt with you know um, the use of embryonic stem cells the um, the use of intrauterine surgical procedures for um, spinal bifida and, and myel um, the, the these kinds of procedures uh, you know, 10 years from now, I can't imagine what what the eugenic uh, picture will look like. Um, it's a whole new world and, um, uh, and, it, and it will do a great deal to eliminate uh, that per percentage of pregnancies that are based upon um, developmental or congenital uh, chromosomal genetic defects. All right. Yeah, we know that this is already playing a role in uh, the decisions that women make about their pregnancies. Um, not too long ago, there was a news headline that said that Iceland has eliminated Down syndrome because no longer children are being born with Down syndrome. Of course, if we think about this a little bit further, we know that they have not found a cure or a correction for Down syndrome, but all children with Down syndrome are being aborted. And so that is straight up eugenics. If we look at history, both uh, during World War II, but if we also look at the treatment of First Nations people in Canada, um, eugenics is a horrible practice that we um, should denounce, that we should not participate in. Because again, human beings are valued not for who they are as humans, but instead devalued because they are not quite up to par. They're not quite up to what society thinks uh, they should be. So um, obviously, as a pro-life advocate, I reject the ending of any life. Um, but I think we should especially ask ourselves, what kind of society do we become when we end the lives of children who are not quite as perfect as we think they should be? Um, we know what has happened in the past when that was uh, promoted by the government or by the powers, uh, people that were in power. And that's an exclusive practice. That's a discriminatory uh, practice where, um, again, the, 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 the powerful get to prey on the vulnerable, the strong against the weak. And instead, I propose a, a worldview where all human beings are valued simply for who they are, whether you have a disease, whether you have Down syndrome, um, and you simply are valued because you're a member of our species. So that's not only a concern for the future, that's a concern right now already. Thank you very much. Yes, Dr. Fellows. Um, when I was using the term eugenics, I was mistakenly uh, using it mistakenly. I meant genetic manipulation. In other words, yeah. while the while the embryos are uh, at the early, early, the earliest of stages, uh, manipulating the genes to man manipulate out the uh, genetic abnormality that um, has been recurring in families, for instance, things like cystic fibrosis. So uh, that I was mistaken in using eugenics in that context, and by no means did I mean to breed out abnormalities. Thanks for clarifying that. And, yeah. 
Okay. Well, I've been out of out of practice too long. <laughs> I, well, that brings us to the end of the event. Um, Thank you so much. In, in our discussion about well preparing for this event, we had talked about a closing statement. I know it's late. Um, I don't know if we could do like a one minute wrap up type of thing, or um, I'd completely. love to hear any final comments Dr. Fellows has. Or Absolutely. Uh, completely depends on the speakers. If you do feel up to it, uh, we would love to have that. Um, uh, would three minutes be okay per, per speaker? I'm good with that. Are you good with that, Dr. Fellows? Absolutely. Sure. You go ahead, Mike. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm just going to grab my notes because I did want to uh, go back to what you said about um, women dying and maternal mortality. Um, so I'll use a little bit of my wrap up to, to address that. Um, Dr. Fellows brought up that um, in several countries or many countries around the world, mater maternal mortality rates are high and women are dying and so they need abortion in order to reduce maternal mortality rates. Um, I don't have time to get into that, um, but it would, it's, it's flawed logic to look at countries that have illegal abortion and that have high maternal mortality rates and then conclude from there that, that women are dying in high rates because they can't access abortion. In most of these countries, healthcare is very poor. In fact, I spend, most, I fe I spend a part of my childhood in Nigeria, which is in, in, in top six of high rates of maternal mortality, and women there die during childhood birth, which you don't solve by providing abortion. You solve that by improving health care, by prioritizing the needs of women, by providing them with safe uh, conditions for, for birth and, and pregnancy. Um, if we're looking at, um, you know, women dying because they're going to access abortion anyway, um, how, do you, how do you measure um, an illegal procedure? How do we know that those numbers are accurate? Uh, people who have claimed that the large numbers of women who die of illegal abortions have later admitted, like Dr. Bernard Nathanson, that those numbers had been inflated to make their case. Um, and so I just wanted to say everything I've said, um, I, I have the studies in front of me here printed out, but they're also in a book written by my colleague Justina Van Man, and it's called Stuck, A Complete Guide to Answering Tough Questions About Abortion. Um, you can order it at thebridgehead.ca slash shop. And the reason why I'm bringing it up is because I believe it's very important that we back up our claims with evidence. And so the studies that I've that I've talked about, um, any of the things that you know I've said would be backed up by the research. With Justina has done a great job compiling in this book. So whether you're a pro-lifer and you want the evidence, whether you're a pro-choicer and you want to dive into you know what pro-lifers really believe, um, I highly recommend this book. And then really to wrap up everything. Um, I've made the case for why human beings should have human rights. Um, I'd rather have made the case for why the preborn should have human rights because they are human beings, as science shows us. Um, every time I pressed Dr. Fellows on that, he steered away from that and went to the difficult circumstances that women face. Um, he went to maternal mortality or things like that. And so he hasn't actually rebutted that claim or answered that question, who do preborn really are? And um, since that is the basis of the pro-life position, that human rights should begin when the human begins, and we know that that point is fertilization, I want to bring it back to that because that has not been refuted. And so in, in terms of all the other questions that have been brought up, um, we've spent a lot of time together, but I wish you know we could really get into some more of those. Um, if you want more research on that, feel free to email me. I would love to engage with anyone who's watching. My email address is mrosendahl at endthekilling.ca um, or order Justina's book. And um, finally, I would just say at the beginning, I started with the question, what is it? What is abortion? Who are the preborn? I've answered those questions. And I believe that a just society will respect the rights of all human beings and all of its members of our species. And so the question to the viewers is, um, where do you stand? Do you believe in human rights or do you not? If you do, then I would challenge you to be consistent and respect the rights of all human beings, both born and preborn. Thank you. Dr. Fellows, what would you like to say as your final statement? 
Well, as you can, as you listen, you can tell that Mika uh, is a skilled um, speaker on this issue. Um, I think the last time I spoke on this issue was uh, the last time that Mika and I were together. Uh, I am, um, I am dismayed to hear, um, you could use the word, a just society to describe a society that would deny a woman a right to choose the outcome of her pregnancy. As I mentioned earlier in my talk, um, women, uh, women's rights are under duress right now. Women are constantly exposed to physical and sexual violence. And the numbers that I gave you don't lie. Um, and I think that, you know, if we really want a just society, while we do make preparation for the prevention of these unwanted pregnancies by giving contraception and education, um, we need to provide safe abortions for women. And um, whether or not Mika believes the statistics on maternal morbidity and mortality, um, even in our own backyard of Ontario, one can see a massive difference in maternal morbidity and mortality before and after the 70s. Um, I think it's fine to have compassion and be caring about the unborn pregnancy, but right now we have women who are desperate and determined and evidence-based morbidity and mortality worldwide supports how uh, desperate they are to end a pregnancy legally or illegally. Um, and if the pro-choice side, uh, pro, sorry, the anti-choice side wishes a legitimate cause to pursue, I would suggest that they pursue the avenue of action rather than trying to deter women from their right to choose what happens to their bodies. That's it. Thank you so um, much. Yes, Dr. Fowler. Thank you very much, Mika. It's been a pleasure debating with you again. We shouldn't let like seven, seven years go by Yeah. Uh, before we do it again. Um, <laughs> and I'd like to thank our uh, hosts as well for uh, for putting on a platform that obviously is not easy to run. You've done a great job. There hasn't been any heckling other than somebody going out for coffee uh, during my talk. Everything else went, went very smooth. I was kind of disappointed that she was leaving during my talk, but anyways, <laughs> it's been a great experience. And as Mika says, it, uh, it's certainly uh, has been outstanding. Even the live debates, I think were not as good as uh, this one, I hope the audience feels the same way. Well, that's something Dr. Fellis and I can agree on. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I would agree that uh, I'm really glad we had the opportunity to debate, um, even though it had to be online, I thought it was done very well. Um, yeah. I know it's uh, reached many people and since it's going online, I know of many people personally who are still planning to watch it. So that's fantastic. So thank you very much to Excellent. the clubs. Uh, to Dr. Fellows and to everyone watching or still uh, going to watch this. Thank you so much. And it genuinely means the world to us. Thank you so much again. Cannot thank you enough for coming here and taking time. Uh, this has been a beautiful debate and it's been such an honor to be able to host this. I'm sure Nina agrees with me and so does Josephine. Uh, yes, 100%. Yes, thank you so, so much. Uh, I hope sometime in the future I get to listen to both of you again. Um, BS. So thank okay. you so much. Take everybody. care, everybody. Thank you. Yes. Bye.